I'm going to be talking about facial expressions, and more specifically, I'm going to be talking about highly intense facial expressions, positive and negative. And the truth is that this distinction in facial expressions goes back to emotions, and in general, in psychology, the distinction between good and bad between positive and negative, approach, avoid. It's really all the same thing. This is one of the most basic dimensions that we as, as humans use in understanding and interpreting the world. And it seems like it's a very clear cut difference. We typically know when we like something or when we dislike something. Now this idea of the distinction between good and bad is very robust in psychological models. I'm not gonna bother you with all the little details of various kinds of models, but if you just take a look, for example, here in one of the most famous models, the circumplex model of emotion, you can see that there's a very big distinction between the positive things over here on this side, the negative things over here on that side. The world of emotions for psychologists is nicely separated with nice clear walls between each other. Now, talking specifically about facial expressions, uh, the work of Paul Ekman, uh, perhaps one of the most important psychologists in the study of facial expressions, he actually even has a TV show based on him, Lie to Me. I don't know if you have ever watched it, but uh, we should all hope to have a, a TV program once based on us as psychologists, I, I wish. And the truth is, he did lots of interesting research on, on these basic facial expressions, basic emotions, and as you can see, there's a very big difference between the negative facial expressions, we have a bunch of negative faces here, and the positive face stands apart. It's very very clearly different from the other emotions. So you would say, well, everything is very simple and very clear. What is there to really investigate about this difference between good and bad? Well, we were still a little bit skeptical, and I'll tell you why. Well, first of all, we have to understand that as psychologists, I would say that more than 95% of the studies that we use when studying facial expressions are actually using these posed artificial facial expressions that professional actors produce for us, and then we have this set of facial expressions that we would use in our experiments, and we would see how do people recognize them, how do they influence behavior, et cetera, et cetera. But these facial expressions that are very exaggerated, very intense, and also very clearly differentiated. I don't think anyone in the room has any difficulty telling apart the good from the bad when we look at these kind of basic prototypical facial expressions. But how often do these facial expressions actually occur in the real world? This is always a problem when we try to uh, balance the, the standardized sets with the ecological validity of, of trying to be true to what happens in real life. Um, a second issue that I think uh, raises some questions about the sharp distinction between good and bad is that when we look to the brain, we often find, in studies that manipulate the emotions of people, that actually the good and bad often overlap, suspiciously overlap. Here we see a specific region called the amygdala overlapping in the study. So we, we see over here the green and the red are actually positive and negative, and the yellow area shows the area of overlap between positive and negative. So we see these regions that are supposed to be, perhaps, that they are separate in our experience, but in the brain, there's so much overlap Maybe the face also sometimes, specifically when things become intense and very strong, also shows some overlap. Well, we need real life facial expressions. Where are we gonna get them? All the sets are these posed artificial sets. So we decided we have to go out to the real world. So for a psychologist to go out to the real world means he's gonna go to the internet. And this is for us, it's very adventurous for us to actually open up the internet and see what things look like in the real world. And we decided to start with some place where the good and the bad are very easily separated and the situation is unambiguous, very clear. And tennis, well sports in general, but tennis specifically, is a very good place to start. Now what's good about tennis? Well first of all, I like tennis. I used to play tennis with my dad when I was young. It was great, it's a good sport. But it's also a simple sport. Tennis is sports for dummies. I spent three years in Princeton and I still don't understand the rules of American football. So it would be impossible for me to use those kind of situations to understand is it good or bad. Way too complex, it's also social. I wanted simple, one-on-one, -on -one, clearly definable situations of extreme positive and extreme negative. And tennis is extreme. If we think about all the big money, the big cash, the big ego, this is, this is big time emotions. And as you can see in this particular sequel of, of pictures, one professional tennis player smashing his racket. It's not the only single racket he smashed in that game. There's lots of emotion going on. So this should be a very good place to get highly intense expressions and we can be able to see the difference between the positive and the negative. Sounds simple and sounds easy, right? Well, 
Here are some examples of the facial expressions. So I'm sure many of you watch sports and perhaps also tennis, and I'm going to let you take a couple of moments of your time to figure out which one is losing a critical point in a professional match and which one is winning a professional match or a, professional, uh, or a point in a professional match. Some of these images are actually taken from the moment of winning the, the whole match. Well, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you're, feel free to kind of guess. So over here, winning or losing? Over here. I'm hearing some uh, <laughs> different voices in the crowd. Let's move on. Three more to go, guys. And? Last one. All right. If this would be my experiment, and you would be my participants, which would be wonderful, because I have a really nice, diverse crowd of people, I actually believe I would replicate my results from what we ran in, in Princeton um, in my postdoc. And you can see here, now that you have the coding of what's going on here, well, you're probably right in some of them, and you're probably wrong in some of them, we call that chance level, actually, in psychology. So this is their actual data when we look at the faces in isolation. Now, it's not fair because I showed you the faces in isolation. When do we see these faces in isolation? We usually see an image. But in this study, we kind of try to break down the stimuli to the faces themselves or to the body themselves or to the faces and the bodies, which I'll show you in a moment. But just looking at the faces in isolation, right, in the bodies in isolation, the faces removed, you can already see that there's some interesting information going on in the body, which perhaps is diagnostic for the situation. Is it highly positive or highly negative? And here, finally, we have the image as you're used to seeing it in a sports magazine or a news broadcast. And here, people typically are doing a pretty good job at differentiating the good from the bad. Um, just to give you some formal uh, data, well, as I said, you know, this is the kind of experiment that you feel the results just by looking at the images. You can see over here that people show a nice distinction. Okay, the, the winning people are showing positive emotional ratings, and the losing people are showing negative emotional ratings. This is when it's based on the body and the face. When it's based on the body alone, we also have the same distinction. But what happens when it's just based upon the face? The same experience you guys had is what happens to our participants. People really are at chance level differentiating them, and overall, they seem to be kind of negative. So, this is very interesting, we thought, and we were, we were interested, well, do people actually know what's going on here? Do, do they have this intuition about how diagnostic the different stimuli are? And we asked participants that saw the whole image, and we said to them, tell us, well, what did you base your decision on? And these are people that saw the full image, the head, face and the body together. We said to them, how did you know if it's positive or negative? And what was interesting was we had like, Basically, half of our participants said it's about the face. More than that, they had their specific theories about what exactly in the face. It's this little crease next to the eye that tells us that it's positive or negative, or well, you can see by the shape of the mouth. But as you saw, when the faces are presented in isolation, people really have no idea. So this tells us that people are using, it hints that people are using information from the body and then reading it into the face. We think we're reading faces. We're not reading faces, at least when things are very intense. We're reading context, in this case, body context, and we're reading it into an ambiguous face. And we said, if that's true, we should, we should be able to play around with the faces and bodies. And we did just that in this study. We used Photoshop, available you know, commercially. It's, it's not, no special rocket science over here. And we started making these combinations between winning bodies and losing faces, losing bodies, winning faces. We started crossing things together. And as you can see, it's the same exact face. There's no difference in the face. It's just planted one time on a losing body and one time on a winning body. Which one is the original image? Any guesses? Very good. But that wasn't our question for participants. Our question for participants was when they saw each image in isolation, what does the face convey? And we have another example uh, with a winning face. And we planted the winning face one time on a positive, one time on a negative body. And we did this with a bunch of faces. I should tell you, we didn't kind of cherry pick five, six faces. We used hundreds of faces, really, in this study. And altogether, our results looked kind of like the experience that you had now, that the same winning face can look positive or it can look negative, depending on the body in which we plant it. And the same losing face can look negative or it can look positive, depending on the body context in which we plant it. So 
you might be asking, and you'd, you'd be smart participants to ask, so is victory and, and defeat special? Is sports special? Maybe there's some special rules to the game, and therefore, how, how much can we really rely on these results? Even though they're interesting, maybe they're kind of a special case scenario, which is, as I said, it's a, it's a good argument. And we decided we have to look on into other areas of these bipolar positive negative situations and see does this kind of effect of the confusability of the isolated face also extend to other areas. So here you see two faces. Now we see two faces, uh, both of them seem intense, both of them seem negative, but each one really has a very different story. So when we look at this face over here, it's actually a facial expression of, of sadness. And this is an extremely tragic situation because this, this mother is holding her baby, her husband, a soldier, an American soldier, killed overseas who never actually got a chance to see his own baby. And she's at his funeral now holding the baby that he will never see, the baby will never know with the father. A complete, uh, purely tragic situation. I can't think of something worse. And this is the facial expression that she's, that she's portraying. If we look at the other woman, she's also holding a toddler and she also seems to be distressed and, and saddened, but really the situation is very different. So this facial expression is taken from an American program called Extreme Home Makeover, which you might have seen in an episode or two of. But just for those of you that aren't really familiar with Extreme Home Makeover, let me give you a little recap of what happens in the program. So we have these, usually these miserable people, as we would say, nebech, uh, the people that, you know, kind of, hard, life is hard for them, they don't have enough money, their house is falling down, and then the team comes in, the team which is going to save them, and they, they do this remarkable job, they take them out of their house, they fly them to Disneyland or something like that for a week, and during that week, they tear down their house to pieces, they build them this lavish mansion, looks like a million dollars, probably worth a million dollars, full of these nice, amazing appliances, the whole thing is really, really astounding, and they do this all in one week. I took, took the university about half a year to like renovate my wall. And then they, this whole thing in one week, I can't believe it. Well, it's really, it's really remarkable. And then what happens after that is the, uh, uh, the people are brought back from Disneyland from their vacation and they're brought right in front of their house but they can't see it yet because the house is obstructed by a big bus. Of course, advertising some bus company, which I can't remember at the time. But they can't see the house, they can only see the bus. At the peak moment of the show, all the crowd around is chanting, bus driver, move that bus. And then the bus moves, and at, at one specific moment of time, this sounds like it was planned by a psychologist, this, this program, the people are exposed to their new house. And the ultimate joy of seeing their new house, so if you wonder what extreme joy looks like, it looks like this. We have dozens and dozens of these faces, and it doesn't only happen in American TV shows. Although I really think this is a genuine expression. I don't think these people are kind of faking it. It's very, very similar across multiple, multiple people, and it's counterintuitive. They should be trying to show a happy face. It comes out miserable, and it takes some time until it improves and becomes a typical happy expression. We see similar faces when American, uh, uh, American mothers are reunited with their soldiers who came to surprise them in, in their house. So we know it's not specific to this specific context. Well, faces looking very similar. Another example, which we have here, perhaps less orthodox and more unusual, is these two facial expressions. Well, where are they coming from? Well, the face that we see over here is actually coming from a person undergoing a piercing. So, yes, oh, that's terrible. It, I know it's terrible, but there are actually many, many of these kind of clips on YouTube. I said the psychologist can just Look into the real world. As far as we get, YouTube is a wonderful source. And the interesting thing is we have these wonderful footage clips. We can see the face. We can see the body. We know exactly when the pain starts, and we can capture the facial expression. And in another example, this is the, this is the unusual, the quirky case, we have facial expressions of people experiencing an orgasm. There is a large set of people that have posted their faces while experiencing an orgasm to the internet. You're saying, really? Yes. Thousands and thousands of them. And these faces have actually been standardized and they've been analyzed for different facial movements. So we have these faces now to our disposed and kind of see. We have pleasure and we have pain. We can see the differences. So when we try and look at all these faces and we put them together for our participants in one study, the pain, the pleasure, the victory, the defeat, the grief, the joy, 
we get this kind of weird, very similar bunch of faces. Participants can't tell them apart. They don't know what's positive, and they don't know what's negative. This is a very striking finding because this is one of the most basic distinctions we would expect for in psychology. And the last thing I'm going to end with is, um, just for your, for your reference, in case you were wondering what's going on there, you, you have a better, a better idea now. But we were wondering, well, is this just about the categorization? Is it because we're asking people to rate the faces that they become confused? What if we would just ask people to simulate the faces? So imagine that you're sitting in a, in a study and you see this face over here. And as a participant in my experiment, I just say to you, don't tell me what's going on in the, in the image. Don't tell me if it's positive or negative. Don't, don't tell me anything. Make your face look like the face you see on the screen. And that's what we had our participants do in this particular study. And they saw sometimes the same exact faces, only planted one time in a positive body and one time in a negative body. And then we want to see what do their simulations look like. And I can show you here, this is called a morph. It's not one particular subject. It's a bunch of subjects that we morph together into one face. But if you just look at these faces, you can see a very clear difference between the simulations, the posing of winning on losing, for example, here, and the posing of winning on winning. So people are seeing the same exact face, and they're trying to simulate it with their muscles, but it comes out different. So this is all a very interesting, I think, lesson in, in psychology of facial expressions. We really are trying to understand the phenomena more. And I think that just to, to kind of recap in a couple of, of, of brief sentences, and, and that's gonna be it. The walls between positive and negative faces break down. This is what we learn when things become intense, when emotions run high, things break down. But people don't notice that. We think that we're reading information from the face, but really it's context that becomes critical. And therefore, next time you hear the expression, read my lips, I'm just saying, think again, it might be read my hips. <laughs> <laughs>